I'm here to talk about the, um, the global commons. That, that's a theme that we're all familiar with, uh, primarily, of course, with the, the closure of the commons in England. It became popular. And, and the common, we talk about commonwealth uh, for many years. Those terms are in, in common, common use, as a matter of fact. And we all have notions of that in our head. What are the commons? And um, it, the issue doesn't go away. The word, the term, the concept doesn't go away. In fact, it's getting stronger and stronger as we increase our human population and the technological might and our industrial throughput keeps going up and we're, we're hitting overshoot in July in terms of sustainability. And then, uh, and then we have still grinding poverty issues and, 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 and international conflicts. And, it's, and then there's now and more and more we're talking about resource wars, freshwater wars, um, and then, of course, the sustainability of, of the climate, for obviously, to, to sustain human and all other life. So the idea of the commons is very much out there, and I think it should be rediscovered and redefined and, and used as a wedge or a, a philosophy of life. And so we have to do some reevaluating of what the commons means. Um, the commons are what we all hold in common, but nobody owns. And so then the, we have the automatic problem of how do we share this commons, who gets to be the shepherd of it, who gets to watch over it, who's in charge? You know, are the oceans, you know, we have our 25 mile limit or whatever it is, and are, the rest of the oceans are still fair game. Anyone can plunder and rape and pillage and pollute there. We have the atmosphere. Nobody really seems to own the atmosphere. So, and it seems perfectly fine to destroy um, what we, the atmosphere which we all hold in common. And um, this goes on and on, and you guys know it only too well. I mean, Antarctica is a, class, is a really interesting example because years ago, the international community said, we will never, ever have ex industrial activity on the continent of Antarctica. And then they sliced it up in, in like a pie that every country has. But it's, it's quite wonderful that we have the sense of commons for Antarctica. Now there's the big rush into the Arctic because of uh, climate change, et cetera. So, who owns the Arctic and Canada's trying to say we own it and the Russians want it and everyone gets their slice and they're going to slice and dice and, and grind it up, right, and liquidate. So um, this is very, very disturbing. I'm sure you guys think about this all the time and that's the impetus for the subject of what I'm talking about. First of all, we have to define, there are several, there's two kinds of commons basically. Well, there's probably three kinds that I'll talk about tonight. One kind of commons is something like Antarctica something that needs to be preserved forever, that nobody touches, nobody owns, nobody influences, nobody impacts. Uh, our parks, Algonquin Park, etc. Well, Algonquin Park is a bad example because we still, well, it is an interesting example for us because we are still logging half of it. So, but it is a commons. The, all the other parks in Ontario and the national parks are free of exploitation. They are true commons, commons for Canadians, and commons for anyone in the world to visit. And they are forever and sacrosanct free of exploitation. Uh, Algonquin Park has, was established to keep the farmers out and so that the loggers could do what they wanted in there. So it has this long, long history of exploitation inside something we call the commons. And also, but the revenue from the logging in Algonquin Park goes to the government. So there's some compensation for using our commons. That's the second type of commons I want to mention, a working commons. A working commons is something we all own collectively, but we allow certain individuals or, or industries to go in there and uh, carry on business type activity. And Algonquin Park is one such example, like we allow the logging to happen in Algonquin Park. Another example to use to continue on Algonquin Park is that there are a couple of hundred cottages in Algonquin Park. Now, if you're a purist like myself, I say we, those, park, those cottages should not be in Algonquin Park. It's the commons. It should be free of permanent habitation. However, that's, that's, that's just one opinion. And to compensate for the fact that they are in there, they have to pay a fee. And they have to pay a fee to the provincial government. So they are compensating the rest of us for the privilege of living in Algonquin Park. Toronto Island is another such example. It's a commons. It's a park. The whole island is owned by the city of Toronto. Yet there are a couple hundred houses in there and people pay for the privilege of living in a park. And so that's another example of a working commons. Then we have to look at the revenue streams that come out of working commons. 
When you have a preserved commons, there's no revenue stream. Well, it's not really true. When we go camping in a park, we pay $11, $13 a night to the provincial government. It's mostly a cost recovery, but it does generate some revenue. So that's a good thing. We're paying for the privilege of being in a, co in a preserved commons. But when you have a working commons, well, who gets the revenue? And then that's when it starts to get very interesting. Uh, in Algonquin Park, on that example, it's a, it's a public organization that does the logging in there and the revenue comes to the provincial government. So that's a, that's a good thing. And that's the kind of the working commons that I'm talking about. You all probably are watching Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey, this show, if you're familiar with it, you're watching, you're with bated breath for the next issue to come out. Downton Abbey, there's this big house and this one family and they're filthy rich, of course. And then they have X number of hundred uh, serfs or peasants or whatever you want to call them who live on the, uh, on the estate. In fact, they have a village on the estate and the doctor and the, the, everyone who lives in the town rents off of the people, the, the rich family who lives in, in, uh, in the big house. Now, for all, for all intents and purposes, that estate is the commons, but because of the way Britain was organized, those, the, the, the big family owns it and has complete purview over this. And the people are basically, they, they work the land and they pay rent to the Lord. So that's a strange system that they have there. Now, in Canada, we don't have those kinds of estates where you, where you have all these people working because we came here as pioneers over the years and, you know, extirpated their, their Aboriginal people, of course. My family included uh, came from the Netherlands and we, uh, we bought a farm. And when I was a kid, every farmer owned their own farm. Nobody rented. It was unheard of renting land from another farmer. Everyone worked their own land. So because of the, that, we rose with the market. So when the land prices went up, every, farm, every family rose with the market. So there was no poverty. We were, of course, rather poor, but everyone was poor. No one was wealthy. No one owned, you know, 500 farms and lived in a big mansion. So we had a fairly equitable situation in my hometown just north of Guelph there. And that's why most of North America was, was resettled after Aboriginal people were, were extirpated. You probably know uh, Alberta has no sales tax, neither does Texas have sales tax because they have oil revenue. So those two states, uh, among others, they collect some of the revenue from oil, some of the commons, some of the revenue of the commons, and they can eliminate their sales tax. Alberta also has a bit of a heritage fund, but they've been drawing it down. And compare that, you've probably read lately about Norway, every single citizen in Norway is a millionaire because they have truly collected the, the revenue from their oil royalties and they've, they're holding it in trust for the, by the government, through the government. So they've done it right in, uh, in Norway, except that of course it's from oil, which is causing climate change, et cetera, et cetera. But from an economics perspective, I don't know if you know that in Alaska, every citizen in Alaska gets a check once a year for one to, one to two thousand dollars of their share of the royalties of oil in Alaska. So Alaska is sharing the, the, the revenue from the commons in because Alaska, the oil wells in Alaska are um, a working commons and everyone gets their share. So it's not a bad little system there. And, but it, on the other hand, it, everyone has buy-in and continuing, continuing to, uh, to, to drill for oil and, uh, and sell it at the, into the world, world market. In Australia, the, 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 the states in Australia, they levy a land value tax, not on the buildings, but only on the land that everyone owns in Australia. So they, even though people own the land, they own it by fee simple. If they keep paying their regular taxes, they get to keep it. But they own the land, so it's a working trust. Land is part of nature, just like oil, just like the atmosphere, just like the, the fish, the oceans. But even if you own the land in Australia, you have to pay a fee to your state government, which we don't do in Canada or in Ontario. You pay your municipal tax, but you don't pay anything to the provincial government or the state or the federal government. That's actually not completely true because in Ontario, we pay about half of the education tax off the municipal rolls. So we, we do levy, the provincial government does levy everyone who owns property in Ontario and charges them a fee which goes to pay for the education bill. So that's one way the provincial government 
collects, like Alaska, like Norway, like Australia, the provincial government does collect some of the revenue from land. So even though you own the land, they have the right to levy it. Just like in Downton Abbey, the, the big lord, he levied all the, the people who lived on, on the estate. Ontario levies everyone who owns property and to help pay for the provincial tax. So some of what I'm talking about is already happening. But what I'm suggesting is that this goes um, to its logical conclusion, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. There's a third kind of commons that we often don't think about, and that's the, the public commons, public infrastructure commons. Is, is the healthcare system in Ontario, is that the public commons? Do I see nods or nays? Is Toronto Hydro, Karen Stintz said she could sell off Toronto Hydro to pay for a subway. Toronto Hydro is public commons, that's public infrastructure. We all own it. So sh are we going to liquidate it to, to, to build some, I mean, that's the kind of thinking that we have to be on our guard from. So not only are, is nature part of the commons, but also public infrastructure, like hospitals, our hospital system, our educational system. The roads are all owned by, except for the 407 in Ontario, the roads are all owned by the provincial and federal and municipal governments. They are the commons. Um, the list goes on. We could think of what else is our, the public buildings, this building we're in right now, is part of the commons. It's a wonderful building. Um, we can go on to libraries. Toronto has 101 branches of library and then there's the, the Metro Library. I'm very proud of that. I don't know, you are probably as well. It's so wonderful to have these things in common. Public spaces like City Hall in front of City Hall, our parks, public squares. Um, another interesting public, public commons is the airwaves. The airwaves that uh, our cell phones operate in and all kinds of other technological wizardry that we fewer and fewer of us understand is publicly owned. The federal government, it was in the paper last week, that the federal government is auctioning off a, a wedge of the electromagnetic spectrum for up to seven billion dollars. So the big telecoms are, they bid on, on a one-off sale of, of telecom. And so that's the way the federal government collects some of the money out of the working commons. The electromagnetic spectrum is part of the working commons. The problem with that is that it's a one-time sale to the telecoms and then they resell it at a profit to other telecoms, whereas the federal government should auction it monthly or yearly and collect all the revenue instead of letting it get dissipated into the other telecoms. But it's very interesting. Uh, of course, resources. Resources are commons, the public called the oil, the gold, the ring of fire now in Ontario, big chromite mines worth billions and billions of dollars. Is, is we all own it. Are we going to get our share of the revenue from the ring of fire? No, we're not. Because we don't have the Norway type structure. We don't have a sense in Ontario, in Canada, that we own these in public, that the government owns it and will take a small slice of royalties, but it's usually not much more than tokenism. Pipeline right-of-ways, um, malls. When you go to the, uh, the Dufferin Mall or the Yorkdale Mall, the walkways between the stores, is that part of the commons? Do you have a right to be there? That's an interesting issue and it hits the papers once in a while because the mall owners say that they control the walkways between the stores and the malls. But then there's other people and lawyers say, no, that's public property, that's public space. And we have a right to sit there and drink our coffee as long as we want and they can't tell us to keep moving. Fascinating, fascinating issue. Beaches. If water goes down for a while, you get more beaches. Who owns the beach? We have in, in Canada that the Queen, or I mean the, the federal government, uh, owns the beaches in, in Canada, which is quite wonderful. This is all land that's, no one controls the land right down to the water. Everyone can walk along every beach. There's issues in Collingwood because people who own land, they think they can run a fence down and block all the walking, but that's not the case. And there's, there's lawyers discussing this. Uh, walking paths, England has wonderful, France, they have wonderful walking path traditions. We have some of that in Ontario, but it's, it's, no, it's nowhere near what it should be. The, the Bruce Trail is going forever, begging landowners to allow them to continue the trail to walk across, uh, to, to, connect, to connect the Bruce Trail. Because landowners have the right to say, no, you, this trail has been there for 50 years, but I can stop it. 
In England, you can't do that. If there's a historical trail, the landowner cannot stop anyone from continuing in perpetuity to walk on that, on that trail. It goes on and on, ecosystems, forests, oceans, atmosphere, etc. These, these are all the commons. Um, sight lines. Lawyers have big arguments when someone wants to put up a building and you're blocking sunlight from some other building, then they call it air rights. And they have to pay thousands, millions of dollars for the right to block someone's air, which is a very fascinating thing. Uh, it's because sight lines are considered public. Soundscapes. When there's, there's the big airport, Toronto uh, Porter Airlines, they want to put in jets. And that will infringe on our noise. And is sound a commons? Do we have the right to quiet? Is that the public common to have quiet? And if someone is going to make a lot of racket, do they have to compensate us monetarily for the privilege of ruining our peace and quiet? And that's another way that government could ge generate revenue um, instead of taxing jobs and businesses. Um, billboards. There are a finite number of spots for optimal spots for billboards. And so the city of Toronto a few years ago said, well, we're going to put a $10 million fee on billboards above uh, just that anyone who has a billboard has to pay a certain fee. And the billboard companies fought it tooth and nail through the courts and they lost. Because Toronto had the right and continues to this day to collect about $10 million for the privilege of billboard companies ruining our sight lines and forcing us to look at these ridiculous, well, some people think they're not ridiculous, but these, this, these billboards with car ads, etc. But it's our right not to have to look at a billboard. So Toronto felt they had the right to charge these companies for the privilege of getting three million Torontonians to look at the billboards. Because sight lines, views, are the commons. It's, it's, this, it's a very fascinating discussion. Uh, pollution. Polluting is not a, a right, it's a privilege. And you should pay, you should compensate the rest of us for polluting. That come, brings in the argument of a carbon tax or any other kind of pollution. If you're going to use the atmosphere as a sink for pollution, you should compensate the rest of us. But in Canada, anyone can pollute. We do it with our cars for free. We do it with our houses for free. We don't compensate the rest of us for polluting the, the atmosphere, which should be part of the commons. And then we get to land. Uh, I own a house in Toronto. It's sitting on a patch of land. And this, I own it, and the police will keep everyone off of it because I own it. But, um, and every year it goes up about 10% in value. So because there's 3 million people in Toronto and people love living downtown, they pay way more than, uh, than that house was worth. Every year it goes up in price. So I get to keep all this money untaxed. So even though this land is part of nature, just like the water or the air or the trees or the fish, I get to keep all the revenue. So there's, there's a huge injustice in Canada, in indeed the rest of the world, because the people who own part of the commons get to keep the revenue that accrues to that, that desirable asset. And that's the, that's the rub of where I'm getting, getting to this evening. Um, I'm not going to be talking about how governments spend money. I'm going to restrict and only interested in where government generates the revenue that they, that they use. Um, because I think that the government is only, is only scratching the surface of the effect that using the tax structure as a policy tool would have if they used it properly. Our present tax structure is designed to, we tax people for, if they have a job. You know, someone gets a job, the government says, yes, finally you got a job, now you have to pay tax. You, you want to go buy something at the store, the, 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 the government says, wow, you're going to buy something at the store? Good, we're going to tax you on it. So even though you need this stuff and it's creating jobs, they're going to tax you on sales. It's ridiculous to tax someone for having a job. There should be no such thing as income taxes. You have a business, you start your business, you do sweat equity, you work, you, you don't make any money for the first 10 years. Year 11, you start making money. The government says, yes, finally you're making money. We're going to start taxing you and punishing you for making money. It's ridiculous. Now, on the one hand, this is a pure right-wing ideology that you shouldn't be paying taxes for your job or your business shouldn't pay tax. But on the other hand, it's a total left-wing ideology because what I'm saying is government should get all of its revenue 
by collecting the, 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 the wealth that accrues to the global commons and not punish people for having jobs and businesses. So that's the, that's the rub of what I'm going to get into tonight with, with my PowerPoint. As citizens, we have a birthright. When we're born in Canada or in Ontario, you, we think we have a birthright. We, we think we have this notion that we have we will receive, by virtue of being a citizen, that we will receive our fair share of the wealth of the commons. But that's indeed not the case. In fact, the only, all of us are sitting in our chair tonight, and I'm standing up here, only by the good graces of the University of Toronto, which has the right to kick us off whenever they want. If I, um, no one has the right to step on the earth in Ontario unless you pay someone. So we don't have, that's right, it's a privilege to step on the earth and we should be compensating everyone for this privilege. We deserve a fair share of the, of the, of the, of the global commons, whether it's the ring of fire where they're going to be starting to mine this massive billions of dollars of chromite, or whether that's oil, or whether I own this plot of land in Toronto, but my neighbor rents. After 10 years, I've, I've accrued a couple hundred thousand dollars tax-free. My neighbor who rents has nothing. So there's a huge injustice that my neighbor should have actually received half of the money that I received. But because of our system is designed, we have an institutionalized um, unequal system in Ontario. We have, a, we have um, an institutionalized system of unequal sharing of the global commons. And this, 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 comes out, this is in our legislation and in the government intervention of this inequality. And we could have, if we followed the ideas that I'm going to be presenting tonight, we could have institutional equality. There is, there is an economic market mechanism that will, that will produce exactly what I'm talking about, and that's what I'll start talking about today. Um, I, I gave us... Um, a beautiful view of a, of a polluting factory to some nice solar panels, gridlock. There was a, there was a 200 car pileup on the 400. <sighs> you know, when you see the, the freeways, this is an aside, when you see the freeways bumper to bumper, you think, that looks a lot like a train, doesn't it? But no, they wouldn't want to have a train. <laughs> oh, this is... Um, they hang the man and flog the woman that steal the goose from off the common, but let the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. Has anyone ever heard that one before? Yes. yes. Isn't that great? I was bicycling out west a few years ago out in Saskatchewan, and I came across this big expanse of prairie, and it said, this is the common. So they still have some commons where I guess everyone grazes their, their cattle out in the prairies. I thought that was very interesting. Economics is the, we all assume economics means the fair allocation of resources. Now, obviously, we know it's very far from fair. In fact, it's grossly unfair. But we still would walk, we still think, well, of course, in Canada, everything's fair. We're all being fair to everyone. So therefore, we, our economic system will, desert, will deliver a fair allocation of resources. No. Economics means a mutual exchange of goods and services. That's what we assume in Canada. You know, Pierre Trudeau years ago wanted a just society. Do we have a just society? Not by a long shot. If so, why do we have pollution, climate change, poverty, unemployment? We have some like 10% of children living in poverty. We have uh, Toronto has about 5,000 street people that live in shelters every night. That doesn't sound very fair. Why do we have res resource exhaustion, sprawl, wilderness loss? Our economic system was designed to grind up nature and produce stuff. And that's what we all wanted so desperately because, you know, Europeans, which most of us are, were so poor through the war, etc. So we wanted an economic system to generate material, material wealth. And we succeeded. And we're so successful that we're grinding up the entire planet that's threatening our existence. But we have a lot of stuff now. Are we happy? I hope so. <laughs> 
But what we need to do is rejig and reboot our economic system so that it delivers what we want now. Right now, most of us, even the most biggest corporate people, they want a healthy, they want a healthy atmosphere, healthy uh, food, etc. So we need, they just don't know how to get it. So we need to rejig and re retool our economic system or primarily the source of tax, tax, taxation to generate what we want. So, we are all tax shifters. Every political party is a tax shifter. Every man on the street from Tim Hortons on down is a tax shifter. Sit someone down and ask them, are we taxing the right things? And they'll say, no, we're not taxing the right things. Somebody else should be paid. We should make the rich tax more, or the rich people say, no, the poor should be taxed more, or we should tax this or tax that. We're all tax shifters. But what I'm suggesting is that we should untax buildings, because buildings are built by humans, and um, buildings always decrease in value roughly 1% per year, but land goes up in value constantly, and so the taxation should be on the land and not the buildings, like Australia does. We shouldn't tax jobs. It's ridiculous punishing someone for having a job. Why would we take steal some of the money they earned? This is right-wing rhetoric, but it makes sense when you're looking at what I'm talking about. We shouldn't tax businesses. We should reward industry and not speculators. And all the taxation, all taxation should be on the use and the abuse of nature. The federal government, provincial government, municipal government should be only taxing sites, sources and sinks. <laughs> A site means land, sources are resources, and sinks are pollution sinks. Governments, all three levels government, can and should get all the revenue equivalent to what they're getting now from the site, sources, and sinks, and not off jobs and businesses. Can you imagine how that would really boost our industry and our, and our jobs? Because people are, be, we've, we've taxed ourselves out of, out of, um, out of jobs, and jobs go offshore because they can hire people far cheaper than us because we have to pay so much tax. Our tax stru structure has to be so much higher. Our taxes, are, our, 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 our um, salaries have to be higher so that we can withstand the tax being taken off. This brings up, obviously, that you're all thinking of a carbon, carbon tax. Uh, British Columbia has a carbon tax, the only one in North America. The government that instituted it got re-elected. So it didn't kill the government. We all remember um, Stéphane Dion suggested a carbon tax and he was mocked to the, to the nth degree. And then uh, Michael Ignatieff received fewer votes than Stéphane Dion did. So there you go, that was a proof was in the pudding. But anyway, there's, um, the, the command and control people will say, well, we have to give every human on earth the right to pollute a certain amount. Give them a ticket, like a food stamp that can pollute. That's carbon rationing. That doesn't get much play, but it's, it does come up once in a while. And then we have the cap and trade, uh, cap and trade thing, so that industry would buy and sell carbon credits from each other. And then, but they never say reduce, because if, if you're going to use a cap and trade, you have to do cap, trade, and reduce. So every year we, you reduce the amount of, of the right to pollute by you know, 5% or whatever. And that, but if we did do it cap and trade, you have to include the reduce, which never is on there. The best way by far is a carbon tax, like British Columbia has. It's a revenue neutral tax shift off of jobs, off of sales, off the businesses, onto pollution, onto um, CO2 emissions. It's not a tax grab, it's not a tax giveaway, it's a revenue neutral shift. And that's what we should have. That, we should extend that to our entire tax structure and untax people, untax businesses, untax sales, and shift the entire tax burden onto the use and the abuse of nature. And British Columbia has made this very small step. When you untax businesses, you're also untaxing business startups because when you start a business, you have to get some land. And so you have to go to the bank and get a loan for X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars to even start your business. And so if you untax, if we, if the, if the, um, if we tax the use of land and not the upfront price, the upfront price goes right down, so it's much easier for a new business or a new homeowner to buy a house, to buy some land. Because it's like when you lease versus buying a car. If you go to a dealer and you want to buy the car upright, okay, you need to pay $25,000, so you have to go to the bank and get a $25,000 loan. But if you go to a leasing company, the leasing company will say, well, no, you don't have to give me any money down, it's just sign here, 400 bucks a month, and then you get a car. 
So if land was like that, you wouldn't have to go to the bank and get a $500,000 loan to buy your land. You just sign in the dotted line and pay uh, $1,000 to the government once a month for the privilege of holding this land. And that way, the bank doesn't get all this massive interest payments, which they now get, and also the government will get revenue. And so then if the government gets revenue from your land, from you holding this land, then government doesn't have to tax jobs. So it's all part, part of the thing. So there'll be a lot more jobs available. As soon as you have more jobs, you have more people thinking and working and designing. You have more innovation, value-added production. Um, there's, we have roughly 25%, 20, 20, 25% of the economy is the underground economy because um, people are avoiding taxation, either sales or income taxes. So if you untax jobs, then the, the black market, the, the underground economy disappears. And if you untax local people, then there will be a lot more local jobs because you won't have to outsource the jobs to somewhere else. Don't punish businesses for being successful, which is what we're doing all the time. Businesses go to great length to hide their profits so that they won't be taxed on it. How perverse. They hire bevies of lawyers to hide their profits. They buy all kinds of equipment and things they don't even need. And then they can fire more people because they cost too much and they use all this equipment which is invariably harder on nature and much less efficient in, in, in use. When you untax labor, you reduce the cost of labor. People will have the same take-home pay, but they won't need to be paid so much. As a teacher, roughly half of my salary gets taxed away in all different types of taxation, whether it's income taxes or sales taxes, what have you. So I could, as a teacher, I could be paid half of what I'm paid now if I wasn't taxed on these other things. I should be taxed on how much nature I despoil, how much resources I used, not be taxed just because I was working hard and tried to get a job. It's ridiculous. And then as soon as you have more people working, once again, a division of labor, value added means um, more people doing higher order. Right now, the economic system tells, tells industry to ship out raw resources. You know, they just ship out the bitumen. They don't even want to process the tar sand stuff in Canada. We ship out the raw logs. We don't make them into fine furniture because labor is too expensive in Canada. We're in, engaged in the massive deindustrialization of Ontario because our tax structure tells businesses, don't hire people, cost too much, just send, sell out the, sh the, the cheap resources because they're cheap. As soon as something's cheap, it gets, it gets liquidated and, um, and as soon as something costs more, then people use it more carefully. Energy, pay for what you take, not for what you make, if you want a slogan. Have you heard of Arthur Pigou? Hands up. There we go. A couple of people. A tax levy to correct the negative externality of a market activity. You could, I suppose, say um, the sin taxes, uh, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, those are Pigouvian taxes. If the government wants people to do less of something, they slap on a tax. Simple as that. So Arthur Pigou, Pigou figured this out. <laughs> He's no dummy. Then there's this other guy, Henry George, which I mentioned there too. Henry George, um, he was one of these 19th century uh, Renaissance men. He, was, he started from very humble circumstances in San Francisco, no, um, Philadelphia. And he lived in San Francisco. He traveled the whole world on a sailing ship at, before he was 20. And he did a lot of reading and thinking and he ended up writing a whole range of books. And, he couldn't figure out why, as cities in the United States started growing, there would be more and more poverty. Because it didn't make sense to him, because uh, everyone said, well, that's, that's just what happens. And he didn't believe that that's what happens. Because he said, as soon as cities grow and you get more in industrial activity and more wealth gets developed, how come this wealth doesn't get shared more equitably? Because it ended up with wealthy people and poor people. Like, when I was a kid on the farm, we were all equally poor. <laughs> We were all equal financially because we all owned part of nature. Whereas as soon as you get into a city, then you have renters and owners, like Downton Abbey, and then you have this bifurcation of rich and poor. And Henry George figured this all out and did his reading, went back to Adam Smith and David Ricardo and John Stuart Mill, and, and uh, even before that to the physiocrats in France, and he figured out that uh, the best way to, um, 
to, to, to solve this problem is to untax people and to, for government to get its revenue from, to collect the economic rent, um, which is the wealth that accrues to desirable finite assets. Economic rent is the term that we, if you don't know that term, is what uh, is critical. Helen Keller says, who reads shall find in Henry George's philosophy a rare beauty and power of inspiration and a splendid faith in the essential nobility of human nature. Economic rent is a term that's not used much these days, but it's a standard economics term. It means a windfall profit or unearned income. I've collected about $200,000 of economic rent on my house. I collected it while I slept. Everyone who owns land in Toronto gets $10,000, dollars dollars $40,000 for free every year. If you rent in Toronto, which is about half the people, you get zero for free. So we have this massive, it's not, the, it's not, the, uh, it's not a racial thing in Toronto, it's the owners versus the renters. Economic rent is community generated. The land that I own in Toronto would be worth almost nothing if it was in the middle of the Yukon. But because it's right downtown, downtown Toronto, it's worth about four or five hundred thousand dollars. And it's because there's a community, there's three million Torontonians around it. That makes my land valuable. So the wealth that accrues to my land every year should be collected by government and not given to me for free. I don't mind getting all this money for free, but it's just not just. It belongs to us all, equitably. I've, I've by being an active member of a citizen in Toronto, working hard, being diligent, law-abiding more or less, um, I have earned half of the money that I did pick up for free, but the other half should have gone to someone else who got zero. It should have been fair. It's not fair right now. And um, fees for the use of the, and abuse of the global commons and my land, I own it, but it is part of nature and so the revenue that accrues to this land belongs to everyone equitably. It's indisputable, you can't argue it, but everyone ignores it because of politics. You, you, know, the, you know the drill. Fees on the, for access to infrastructure. If, you are, um, if you're a, a courier company, you get to, you buy your cars or your bicycles, you get to use the roads for free. I mean, you have to buy a license if you have a, let's just use the, the courier company, the bicycle couriers, that's an, a simpler example. Simpler example. Courier companies, bicycle couriers or foot couriers, they get to use the sidewalks, they get to use the roads for free because bicycles don't pay any fee at all. So the company that owns the courier, courier company, they are taking advantage of the free roads in Toronto. And these roads aren't free at all. It takes taxpayers' money to build and maintain them. So there's, that's just an example of how um, our, our, uh, we, have, we have all this public commons uh, which, is, which belongs to us all, but people are taking advantage of it. So courier companies ideally should be paying an extra fee for the use of the roads. People probably know that um, big trucks that are on our freeways, they pay only a fraction of what they should pay for the destruction of our freeways. Something like, you know, they pay one-tenth of what they should, should pay. They are also taking advantage. Um, one of the reasons Ontario was, is a car manufacturing hub is because we have free health care. So we are subsidizing every car by everyone else paying for the healthcare system. So healthcare is a public good, and if you're taking advantage of it, you have to compensate the rest of us. Roughly 30% of our economy is earned income, of our GDP is earned income. That's money that people actually earn when they work and when they make a product or provide a service. And, or roughly 70%. And unearned income is 30%. So the, the, the money that people receive for free by cornering, uh, owning part of an asset as a desirable asset is roughly 30% of the economy. And uh, coincidentally, all levels of government also collect about 30% um, of the GDP to provide government services. So by this mathematics, as, 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 as rough as it is, you can see that if government untaxed people and businesses and sales and collected the unearned income throughout the, the economy in Ontario and Canada and Toronto, we, would, we could truly untax labor and business. Adam Smith, the assumed, assumed founder of modern economics, ground rents, which is land value taxation, 
the species of revenue which can best bear to have a peculiar tax imposed upon them. So he even, he knew full well of exactly what I'm talking about. It's a very critical thing. All the classical economists know exactly what I, I'm talking about, what they talked about. But income taxes got, slowly came in, sales taxes slowly came in when no one was, was watching. And now we have this really screwed up system which generates poverty and ecological destruction. Government revenue. We shouldn't be taxing incomes, business, and sales. It should be moved to levies on the use and abuse of nature. When you, I use the term taxing and levying on purpose. When you tax something, you're taking money they actually earned. If you levy something, you're collecting revenue which they didn't earn. So, and that, those are, those are, because it's not a tax. When you collect, when a, a carbon tax should be called a carbon levy, it's not a tax. You're, you're collecting a fee for the privilege of polluting the atmosphere. So it's a fee, it's not considered, it shouldn't be considered a tax. A green t tax shift is off of earned income and onto unearned income. Of course, the unearned income, since it's not earned, is part of the 30% which belongs to us all. And the earned income should stay with the person who earned it. The Pembina Institute coined the, the phrase ecological fiscal reform, which was basically green tax shifting. And um, they were basically saying the same thing with different terminology, but talking about pollution levies, resource use fees, notice they don't use the word tax, site rental, land value taxation, which uses the word taxation, that's, but it should be a site rental fee, infrastructure access fees, that's, so we should be collecting the resource rents for, and which will incent conservation, preservation. It will reduce material throughput. There will be less pollution because it, it will, there will be charged a fee for the privilege of polluting. You'll be charged a fee, for the, a higher fee for the use of, of resources. And it will incent innovation and value added. Joseph Steiglitz, rent is the secret tax the wealthy charge the poor. We, you know, we all know this, right? If, if, if I, I could, my house is paid off, I could mortgage my house again, buy another house, get someone to rent it, and they will pay the mortgage of that house, and I could keep doing this indefinitely. If you just keep priming the pump and you can keep, you keep buying more property, and that's what big landowner or big uh, property managers do. They use the rents to buy more property and they keep building this up. And so as a, as a result, you're keeping more and more people completely free. At the end of every year, keep people uh, poor. At the end of the year, every year, they still have zero in the bank. Economic rent capture is pro-business. It's land efficient. We have in our cities lots of underused sites. Corners, you know, there's important corners. They have a one-story building on it. It should have a 20-story building on it. But, but because the owner is not interested in that and they pay such low tax to the city, they let this land remain underused. And then they, they do nothing on this land and then all the other land goes up, it, all the land goes up in value and then they sell it at a certain point for speculative purposes. As I explained before, when you collect the rent of land, if government collects the rent of land, right now I pay on our house uh, about $2,500 taxes every year. But if we had a fully phased in economic rent capture system, I would pay to the federal, provincial, and municipal governments uh, about $1,000 a month instead of 200 a month. So I'm paying roughly 200 a month to the city of Toronto right now. But, if we, but at the same time, I wouldn't be paying income taxes for my teaching job. And there would be no HST. That's, that's what it would look like. So we can all think about our own personal situation. And, and so what happens when, as soon as as soon as this system comes in, if I had a lot more land in downtown Toronto than I needed, I'd be paying a lot extra tax that I wouldn't really need. So then I would be incented to sell off or s half the land. And so then it would reduce sprawl because there'd be more intense use in the, in the downtown area. And there's also sprawl in farmland because farmers underuse their land 
and then the next farmer has to go farther and farther. There's sprawl in forestry, there's sprawl in mining. We never think of these things as sprawl, but it's the same problem. If you had to pay and compensate the community, the true value of the privilege of holding this monopoly, you would either sell off half of this monopoly to someone else, or you would, or you would use it more efficiently yourself. Um, there are two types of assets. There are house-like assets and land-like assets. The taxation or the fee should all be on the land-like assets and we shouldn't be taxing cars. When you buy a car, you shouldn't be taxed on it. There should be no tax on the building. MPAC, the Municipal Property uh, Assessment Corporation in Ontario, should assess the, the land in Ontario and ignore the buildings. And that's that way because right now, if you fix up your building, the tax man says, wow, you're a good citizen. You fixed up your building. We're going to tax you heavier. Like it's perverse. And conversely, if you let your building fall apart, the tax man says, oh, you're, a, you're a, not a good citizen at all. Your building's falling apart. It's a blight on the landscape. We're going to reduce your taxes, okay? You know, it's again, it's perverse. It's the opposite of what should happen. So what we should do, all the taxes should be on the land-like assets which accrue wealth which attract wealth because they are desirable. Oil, water, quotas, farm quotas, taxi medallions. It costs about $500,000 to buy the right to drive a taxi in Toronto. And instead of paying someone else this $500,000, it's like buying a house, the, federal, the, the city government should charge a fee for the monthly use or the monthly privilege of driving a taxi. And so that taxi driver, instead of giving someone else 500000 that they had to borrow in the bank to pay all this interest to the bank, should just circumvent that whole system and pay a fee, a monthly fee, to the City of Toronto. The electromagnetic spectrum, as I mentioned, billboards, ur urban land, air rights. The airplanes are flying all, all, over, uh, all the time across us, polluting the air. That's another thing. Um, and they're destroying our, 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 the, the sound, et cetera, so they should pay a fee to the federal and provincial governments for the privilege of landing at Pearson. They should pay a fee for, for, for the, the, the sound and the pollution that they produce. Thomas Paine, men did not make the earth. It is the value of the improvements only, which means buildings, and not the earth itself that is individual property. Every propriety owes to the community a ground rent for the land which he holds. The story is that it was the classical economists who understood this. And they, the three factors of production were land, labor, and capital. But then the neoclassical economists, they left land out of it. And land means nature. So now the, 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 the economy is just, is just labor and capital. And then, um, so Marx was one of these neoclassical. Marx came along and said, oh, the battle is between the owners of production and the workers. No, the, the workers and the owners rise and fall together. If the wor workers don't work, the rich don't get richer. The rich get poorer if the, work stop, if the poor stop working. But if the, so, but if, um, so it's not the rich versus the poor, it's the owners who are collecting all this unearned income and getting rich in their sleep that are the problem. And it's the owners versus the not owners, not the, not the capitalist versus the, the worker. Today's property tax, if, as I said, if your building is run down, your taxes go down. If you keep your building up, and it should be like this. So whether your building is run down or in good order, it should be taxed at the same rate. So that the person who builds their, keeps their building up should not be punished for keeping their building in good shape. But in Toronto, we have this ridiculous system that the, the tax, uh, the city levies a tax against your property value, not just the land. Land value taxation is off the buildings and onto land value alone. If you want to know how much land is worth, you just figure out what the rental value of land is. If you want to you just take away the cost of, of, um, of the building itself or the maintenance of the building, take away the cost of um, utilities, and what you have left is the rental value. Like I have our house, we could probably rent it for 1500 a month, easy. 
but there are costs to, uh, for utilities, there's costs for maintenance, et cetera. So take 500 off of that. So that's where you arrive at that, I sh that the rental value of our house is about $1,000 a month. So I am getting the imputed rental value of our house. Well, not me, my girlfriend and I, of course, we have to share. <laughs> so the, the imputed value comes to us, even though we don't pay ourselves a check for $1,000 every month. But so I should be, we should be paying that $1,000 every month to the three levels of government and not, um, and, and not paying income taxes or sales taxes. Did you have a question, Jean? Well, it's, Margaret? It's, it's rent of land that you're talking about. Yes. Said rent, that's rent of the house, but it's not rent of the house. It's the rent of the land that you're talking Yes, because I took away the value of the house by that $500. But the only reason people want to live where we live is because of where it is. If my land was in the Yukon, I couldn't charge a thousand bucks a month for it because people say, forget it, it's just frozen and mosquitoes up there, I'm not going to live there. But it's desirable, it's only desirable assets that, that accrue um, economic rent. If we had land value taxation, uh, we wouldn't have had the, the dot com, or not, we wouldn't have had the, the subprime mortgage fiasco a couple of years ago. Because the, when there is all this speculation in land, it's not in buildings. Buildings, you can always build more buildings and they go down in value, but land goes up in value. So everyone was speculating and then the bottom fell out. If, if the government collected the economic rent of land, there'd be no incentive to speculate. And we wouldn't have the wild swings in our economy that we have every 18 years or so these days. The buildings to land ratio would be much better. We would have more buildings on less land in desirable areas and vice versa. This would happen in mining, forestry, uh, agriculture and urban land. Sprawl is basically big landowners, they buy up land, it gets rezoned or they corrupt, they buy politicians to rezone it, then they build a bunch of shoddy houses and the, the land goes up ten times in value and they, they make a killing. Building houses for developments is an irritant. Build house, developers, they're not interested in building houses. They just do that because they have to, to, to be able to flip the land. So if we collected the economic rent of land, there'd be no incentive for, for developers to sprawl. If you're a developer and you get to buy a couple of thousand acres and fill it full of houses, you can go and you get to collect all this economic rent, you're making a big pile of money. But if you build that same house in infill downtown, you're, the land is already worth that much and anyway, so there's no rise in the value of the land just because you built that house, because that land has value because of everyone around it. So land value taxation would, in, would give a level playing field to infill, infill as it does to sprawl. And right now the bias is dramatically towards sprawl instead of infill. It would also impact agriculture because young farmers, they don't have five million dollars to buy a farm these days unless they get it from their parents. But if we had land value taxation, then they wouldn't need to go to the bank and get a two million dollar loan to buy a farm. They just sign in the dotted line to fork over a couple thousand every month for the privilege of holding that land. And they could get that revenue starting immediately as soon as they started farming. It would up, it would afford, it would um, offer access to land for young farmers, which is so terribly absent these days. Same thing with uh, quotas for shipping milk or, or chickens. Um, this is just like a taxi license. It costs a fortune for the privilege of shipping milk. And so you have to go to the bank and get another couple of million dollar loan, paying all this interest to the bank for the privilege of shipping milk or, or chickens. And since the value of milk quota is all economic rent, it's all unearned income, if there was a monthly fee paid to government for the privilege of shipping milk instead of buying this quota from some other farmer, then the banks would be cut out of the picture. The banks would be the big losers, of course. The banks love the system exactly the way it is now because they're gen generating massive amounts of, of, of interest, which is uh, so detrimental to, to everyone. The tax upon land values is, therefore, the most just and equal of all taxes. It is the taking by the community for the use of the community of that value which is the creation of the community. Henry George.
Roosevelt, I believe that Henry George was one of the really great thinkers produced by our country. Now, I don't want to get into a cult of, of personality here. Uh, that's always a problem because the, the notion of funding government out of economic rent didn't come from Henry George at all. It started with the physiocrats in France in the time of, the, of Louis XIV. Was that not correct, Sue? It was real early and um, the only, that, France would have been the first country to do this except for the French Revolution <laughs> happened and ruined it. And uh, then they got into this, uh, this whole other thing. So that, that, that's what preempted that. But uh, as I said, that, um, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, there's a whole raft of classical economists all um, advocated this. And Henry George came along and sort of cottoned on to this. And by first force of his personality, he was a famous speaker. He traveled all over the world. He, was, he wrote books, uh, this book particularly, and a whole bunch of other ones that were very, very popular. So he personified the movement. So it's not a personality cult at all to, to praise Henry George, because he didn't invent the notion whatsoever. Um, but, uh, but he was the guy who, with, by force of personality, popularized it greatly. And then it was doing really well in the, in the 19th, uh, end of the 19th century. And then uh, the 20th century came along, Hitler came along and reframed the argument again, as I said, between the owners of the means of production and the workers and ruined the whole notion that it's actually the owners of desirable finite assets versus everyone else who doesn't own it. So, so uh, um, Karl Marx, etc. cetera. Um, did I say Hitler? No. Yeah. I meant, I didn't mean, I meant, I meant uh, communism. I didn't mean Hitler at all, sorry. <laughs> yeah, communism reframed the argument of, um, and, and ruined the whole notion of, the, of owners versus workers. Self-financing self infrastructure. This is an interesting one. I've been getting a number of letters from the Toronto Star, et cetera, published about this because when the city builds infrastructure, the land values around that infrastructure go up. You have, let's say you have a small town somewhere in Ontario, it has no hospital. So people think, well, do I really want to move there? There's no hospital in that town, you know, small town. The province taxes everybody all over Ontario, builds a nice hospital, and then everybody says, wow, now I want to move to that town. That's public infrastructure built by public money from around the province, and if everyone wants, a lot of people want to move to that town, they will bid up the price of land, so then the land values go through the roof in that town because of the hospital. So, which is very fair, which is very unfair to all the people around Ontario who are taxed and it, taxed to pay for this hospital. So what should happen, the province, yes, should build the hospital if it's warranted, if it's needed. I say warranted infrastructure because otherwise you could build white elephants and it doesn't raise land values because it's not an important, it uh, doesn't have that effect. So the province, yes, should build the hospital or the school or the transit or even a road, whatever, but then collect the rise of land value to pay for that asset. It should be like a silo, a silo fee or tax. And that's the way it should be happening. So we shouldn't be taxing jobs, punishing people for having jobs, punishing businesses for being successful to build a hospital in a town which will only benefit the people who own land in that town, unearned income. So this self-finding infrastructure self-financing infrastructure is exactly how Toronto should build all the subways and transit that we need these days. We shouldn't be taxing jobs, we shouldn't be taxing <coughs> gasoline, even though I have no love for the automobile private, for the, for the internal combustion engine, um, but we shouldn't be taxing gas, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be taxing uh, sales taxes, we shouldn't be taxing incomes, and it shouldn't be on the municipal rolls either, because municipal rolls are based too much on buildings and not land. But it should be the land value around that asset that goes up should be collected to finance the project. And the studies have shown that any, any warranted infrastructure, the key being warranted, always raises land value far more than the cost of the original infrastructure. If Toronto figured this out, we'd be way ahead of the game. And Hong Kong has figured this out. Hong Kong owns all the land in Hong Kong and they rent out prime spaces to businesses who want to be near where the subways stop. And the businesses gladly pay it because they know that the subway is going to deliver all kinds of customers right to their store. So that's how Hong Kong builds its, um, its transit system. 
Your taxes fund the infrastructure that makes my land more valuable. I have a friend who lives down in uh, Riverdale, and he's saying, he's saying, Frank, as soon as, as, soon as the, they finally announce the, the, re the downtown relief line, which is going to clo go close to his house, he says, my land is going to go way up in value. And he says, the day they open that downtown relief land, his land is going to go through the roof. So, and he knows full well that he's not earning this money. It's taxpayers around Toronto are going to build the relief line, but it'll only benefit the people whose land goes up because they happen to live right where that uh, relief line is going to be. So he says, he grudgingly says, well, Frank, you're right. That money should be collected to pay for the subway. <laughs> It'll have dramatic, dramatic effect on the urban design. As I mentioned, we'll have a lot less sprawl and decay. Uh, we'll have walkable communities, more affordable because you won't have to get a loan from the bank to buy the land. You'll just pay a fee to government in lieu of other taxes, so it won't cost you anything, actually, et cetera, et cetera. This is the kind of place I want to live in. Same thing in agriculture. You know, you go north of Toronto, and uh, as soon as you get past the city limits, what's, what's growing there? Corn and soy. It's corn and soy all right outside Toronto. There's three million people in Toronto. We should, this land is so valuable up there, but it's owned by some developers just sitting on it, waiting it for, the, for the price to go up, and then they'll throw a bunch of houses on there and make a big killing. This land is so valuable, it should be used for agri-vacations. There's, there's like a half a million or a million school kids should be on it all the time. But it's used for corn and soy and corn and soy. It's, it's ridiculous. Social services like pensions, health care, etc., should not be financed by taxing income, businesses, and consumption, because that dampens the economy. It damages the economy. As soon as you tax a job, you're knocking people out of jobs. As soon as you tax a business, you're making businesses closer to bankruptcy. But instead, if you collect the fees on resources, land value, and pollution, you don't, you're, you're not hurting any business. You're not hurting any job. In fact, the opposite. We should be tax shifting onto economic rent, just like Adam Smith says. This is a rough, a rough list of the revenue that the federal government in Canada could collect. These are all the sources of economic rent that they could. I, this is just a bunch of numbers that I crunched a couple of years ago. Conventional oil is, should be good for 32 billion. Tar sands oil, 11 billion, because it costs a lot more to get tar sands oil out of the ground. My personal opinion, it should stay in the ground permanently, but this is an economics discussion, et cetera. And you can go down, the, there's three kinds, three kinds roughly of sources, resource rents, infrastructure rents, the federal government was selling, as I said, uh, a swath of, of, of spectrum last week for $7 billion. So it's, it should be worth about $10 billion a year in lieu of other taxes. The internet, desirable um, URLs, desirable um, uh, names should also, are common domain, should be considered common domain. You can also buy privilege of moving your ideas faster on the internet by, by buying it. And that's also a privilege. The internet should be considered the commons. And you should pay if you're going to abuse or take advantage of the commons. And that should ra ra raise some revenue for government in lieu of other taxes. The stock market, the TSX in Toronto is worth billions. And it wouldn't be here if Toronto wasn't here. So therefore, it has a responsibility to compensate the rest of the citizens for the privilege of having three million people or seven million people, whatever, right close to the, to the, to the stock markets. And so it should be, be uh, and then the list goes on, quotas, licenses, billboards, air rights, and then there's Pagovian taxes. And if you add all this stuff up, you end up with, I'll just go here first. This is, uh, this is shows that if you add all those sources of economic rent, you can completely eliminate income taxes, completely eliminate business taxes, completely eliminate sales taxes. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a, uh, this is not a comprehensive study, but the point is theoretically and philosophically, uh, it's an absolute desirable, fair, straightforward, um, 
completely different way of financing governments that would have multiple benefits. So that's, that's my point and that's what, uh, uh, I, sh I suppose I should have said at the beginning, I'm part of the international think tank of uh, this economic rent capture. There are people all over the world that have been thinking about this for a couple hundred years and I just happen to be one of them at this point. Sue Hansel here is a, a member of our organization, Earth Sharing Canada. And um, uh, we're, we, we promote this in, in every way we can. We're very much under the radar. We, all, we, draw, we come above the radar very briefly once in a while. But it's an idea that's hung on and continues to hang on because it makes paramount sense. Oops. Just wanted to show you, oops. Uh, John Stuart Mill. I I forget my glasses to read this one. <laughs> Landlords grow rich in their sleep without working. Same with me. I've picked up a couple hundred grand on, in my sleep. Without working, risking, or economizing. The increase in the value of land arising as it is from the efforts of an entire community should belong to the community and not the individual who might hold title. When the sacredness of property is talked about, it should always be remembered that any such sacredness does not belong in the same degree to landed property. No man made the land, it is the general inheritance of the whole species. And when he says land, we assume in the modern context it also means resources and pollution. So if you want to talk, again, one of the classical economists, so it, this, this is a, a very, very profound idea that would have dramatic implications throughout our, our, our economies and our societies. Economic rent capture serves, serves the needs of the planet, invigorates the economy, shares global commons, respects future generations. If you're a fund manager and you're responsible for investing a couple billion dollars, you have to, and you're, you have green leanings, you say, oh man, I wish I could put it into wind turbines or solar panels. But the, if you put your money into wind turbines and solar panels, you may get zero uh, profit. You may get two or three or five or seven percent profit. But you won't get 50 percent profit or 100 percent profit. But if you put that money into tar sands oil or conventional oil or chromium mine in Northern Ontario, You'll, your your, your um, investors will realize 100%, 200%, 50% profit. So every fund manager it has no choice but to invest in liquidating nature. They have absolutely no choice. If they even mentioned investing in sustainable this or sustainable, they're out the door. So our whole system is designed because economic rent is not stripped off of these desirable assets. If the economic rent was stripped off the assets of, of conventional oil, the, our federal and provincial governments would be receiving, well, um, we know it costs about $35 to, to get a barrel of oil, of conventional oil out of the ground, yet it's sold for $100 a barrel. So, you can do the math, $65 for every barrel is economic rent. Economic rent is revenue without a corresponding cost of production. And so the cost of production of getting oil out of the ground is 35 bucks. Or tar sands oil, it's about $50 or whatever. But all the rest is economic rent, which belongs to all of us and should go directly to government in lieu of other taxes. Because if you're starting a business, you want to hire people, you have to pay them so much because they're getting taxed so much, you can't start a business. It's not economical. So if without income taxes, without sales taxes, so many more businesses would be viable. And at the same time, as soon as the government stripped off the economic rent off of virgin resources, off of sprawl, off of oil, what have you, then from that moment on, it would be cost effective for a fund manager to invest in green stuff, in renewables. Because as soon as economic rent capture allows a business to have three or four or five percent profit, which is an accounting profit. But anything above that is a super profit. Australia has a super profit tax that they put on the minerals. Canada has no such thing. Canada, we are a Wild West show of mining. We, um, something like 75% of the world's mining companies are registered in Toronto. Because we have the laxest, the most lax, if laxist is a word, the most lax system of royalties anywhere in the world. So all the companies, they register in Toronto and they get to keep all their, their um, 
their unearned income. Let's say you owned, let's say you owned a, a mine, but you didn't have the time or interest or, of developing this mine. So you told somebody, okay, you can come and build a mine on my property and you can keep 75 or 80 percent of everything you get out of there. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, okay, how much will you pay for the privilege of mining on my territory? And the person will say, oh, well, I need to make a profit, at least five, six, seven percent profit. Okay, I'll pay, you can keep, you can keep, keep 60, 70 percent of the revenue, but as long as I get my seven or eight percent profit, then I'm good to go. And that's what it should happen with every resource industry. Because then there would be no incentive to liquidate nature just because when renewables are all available, conservation is cost effective, but it doesn't pay 100% return on investment. The ROI is not there. So that's what I'm talking about. And it just mind boggles um, how this would ripple through our economy. It, it's, it's rather fascinating. You can see, hopefully you can see the attraction of why this idea has stayed around for a couple hundred years and hopefully will gain ground and it makes par paramount sense. The problem, I guess, is the people who are benefiting, who are collecting economic rent, are automatically the people with political power. So roughly, you know, say 50% of the population of Toronto collects economic rent and they're the people who own houses and they're the people who vote for municipal campaigns, can candidates. People in apartments are notorious for not voting. So politicians don't even bother with apartments at all. They know they're not going to vote. And those are the people getting screwed by the system. But it's, there's still something that I haven't quite figured out yet about this, this whole thing. Roughly, let's say about, let's say 25% of businesses collect a lot of economic rent. And these are the resource businesses and the, and the property-owning businesses. But roughly 75% of businesses actually produce a product or provide a service and don't collect economic rent. So it just, I don't understand why these 75% of businesses who actually have to earn every dollar don't gang up and elect some political party to put the screws to those businesses that are collecting all this free, econo free, re free revenue. So anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of wedge that a political party could drive if they had their act together. They could really talk to these 75% of business people and saying, look, you guys are working day to day, earning your money, every penny you earn. If you're earning a little more, then someone else is going to come into the business that you started, the same type of business, and knock down your profit margin. You guys are, but look at over these guys here. The government grants a monopoly to a mine. They give them rights to, to, uh, to oil wells. And they get to keep the, the potash industry is phenomenal in Saskatchewan. Those companies, remember there was, um, was it BHP, was it China or Australia? They wanted to buy the potash in Ontario. Why did they want to buy, not in Ontario, in Saskatchewan. Why did they want to buy our potash industry? Because it generates massive amounts of unearned income. Because potash is a highly, S very scarce, desirable asset. There's only like two or three places, there's Russia and Chile and, and, and Saskatchewan, that mine potash. And it's so important for agriculture, petrochemical ag agriculture. So it generates massive amounts of, of, uh, of economic rent. That's why these other companies from around the world want to buy it. But if Saskatchewan, but Harper said, no, it's a strategic uh, asset, we won't allow, because Harper wanted our own company to collect all this unearned income and not give it to some Australian company. Norway, where they strip off almost all the rent of oil and put it into their public purposes there, the Norway invests in the tar sands because they get to keep all the economic rent from, that should go to Canadians. You get the picture. <laughs> all right, questions, <laughs> comments?